Welcome to the Longevity Forum podcast, a series on achieving longer, healthier, and more fulfilled lives for as many as possible. In this session, we are very happy to have our two co-founders of the Longevity Forum. Dafina Grapsi Penny will be interviewing Andrew J. Scott on the business of longevity. I'll leave the rest to Dafina and Andrew. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, Andrew. And it's a pleasure having you as our guest on the Longevity Forum podcast today, where we'll be hearing from you rather than uh, you, I suppose, interviewing uh, the many the many experts and, and peers that uh, you have very kindly interviewed for the Longevity Forum podcast over the past uh, uh, couple of years. So as Laura mentioned, um, for those who are not familiar, Andrew wears many hats. He's a professor of economics at London Business School, a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research, and a co-founder of the Longevity Forum, among many other prestigious affiliations and associations. Andrew's current research is focused on the economics of longevity and aging, as well as their broader implications. Andrew's award-winning book, The 100-Year Life, which has been published in 15 languages, including a Japanese manga version, is an Amazon bestseller and was runner-up in the FT McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award 2016. And this was followed by his latest book, The New Long Life, which capitalized on the huge success of The 100-Year Life by exploring further how the challenges and opportunities of social and technological ingenuity might shape a new age of longer life. So going back to the 100-year life, Andrew, you were probably responsible for bringing the topic of longevity to the mainstream globally, if I may say. And I was wondering, perhaps, if you could tell us a little bit about how your interest in this area developed. (laughs) Good question. Happy accident, really. And it's interesting thinking about it. I think there's kind of a couple of them, sort of personal and professional. I mean, personal was just, I spent, you know, what, 30 years of my career focusing on business cycles and monitoring fiscal policy. And I was getting a little bit bored, uh, which of course is an irony because the 100 year life is about longer working careers and multi-stage life. So I think part of it is also just, I've always been interested in big picture issues and they don't come much bigger than longevity. And I used to give a lecture at London Business School on world economy called Problems and Prospects, of which there are more problems and prospects these days. But I give a talk about an aging society and it was pretty miserable. It was all about how there's more and more old people, we can't afford it, old people are a problem. And then there was just this chart in the middle of it that just said, on average, we're living longer and we're healthier for longer. And that just made me pause because you think, well, that doesn't sound bad news. How we turn this good news story into such an overwhelmingly bad news story? And that got me thinking and made me realize that the sort of negativity of an aging society story was very uh, one-sided and it was incomplete and possibly wrong. And really, we had to think about how we spent having more time. And that was how I got into longevity as a different perspective from aging. And it's a phenomenal topic because I've always been interested in big trends. But this is a trend that affects each of us in a very individual way. It's not just an aggregate trend that's reshaping society, but it's something we all have to grapple with as we see our children behaving differently, as we think about our parents and how to care for them when they get very old, but also navigating our own life in a different way. So that got me, this wonderful, huge topic that was incredibly important, I think was misunderstood, that brought together so many different intellectual disciplines, but at the same time was so personally intimate. And as you say, Andrew, longevity is a multifaceted and possibly limitless topic. Um, but I know that as an economist in particular, the longevity eco- economy as a, as a concept has been of a particular interest and a key area of your focus for, for your research and more recently for a, for a course which you have just finished teaching at uh, the London Business School, uh, a course called The Business of Longevity. I was wondering whether you could Tell us a little bit about the course, perhaps the motivations behind launching the course, and what were some of the kind of key key learnings from that? Yeah, so I just finished teaching this 10-week course, which has been a lot of fun, a lot of work. So it's been very interesting to see how this concept of how we adapt to longer lives and how we prepare for longer futures is starting to infiltrate into different groups and areas. And, you know, five or six years ago, there weren't so many people talking about it and now they feel ever more in different areas there's a sense of momentum building up 
But I'm also very conscious that though ideas are really important, and it's really important to help people understand what is happening, we kind of can't just talk about it. We've got to do something about it. And, uh, you know, I'm always attracted to putting ideas into action. And for me, what's absolutely key is to get business interested in this because business isn't too bothered by the big picture. It just wants to do. And, you know, businesses are going to be a key way in which we get out the the products and the services that help people adapt to these longer lives that are so urgently needed. You know, there's lots of change required. We need new government policies. We need new individual behaviors. But we need firms to seize this opportunity and provide the products and services to help us live longer, healthier, and more engaged lives. So how do we get business doing it? And there's loads of people in this area who are passionate about the topic. But I think for it really to become mainstream and start to change the world, we've got to get people who aren't passionate about it, but just say, wow, this is a big business opportunity. So that's why I wanted to put on the course at the business school, uh, the business of longevity. Uh, I wanted to try and make a younger generation who are going into business aware of this huge market opportunity around longevity. Because if we're living longer lives, the most valuable thing is to age well. And we're not really geared up for that at the moment. So it's an enormous business opportunity. And whether you're going to do a startup or go and work for a multinational company, I wanted people to be aware of this opportunity. So that's my main motivation for launching the course. I wanted to get a cohort this year and in the future who would then go on to business and be aware of the opportunity and start to innovate and develop the products. Lots of other reasons as well, because I think, you know, you said longevity is a very broad topic and it is. And wrestling with that dimensionality, I think, is a challenge because everyone's aware that a combination of more old people living longer lives is a huge market opportunity. But even though it seems huge, actually finding it and cracking it, I think, is a much bigger problem. So I wanted to put a course on for slightly selfish reasons as well, to try and just work out some different strands uh, and try and understand this market a bit better. So in defining then this market, um, I mean, have you come across, presumably, I know that you're, you're fascinated by statistics and, and you spend probably your day analyzing data and statistics. Um, how big is the longevity economy? Well, I mean, it's kind of always as big as the number you want to try to select. I mean, and certainly, you know, there's a variety of numbers out there. So the ARP define the longevity economy as basically any money spent by people aged over 50 and they say it's currently worth nine trillion dollars and is going to increase enormously um you know i I did some work with david sinclair and martin ellison where we said that if you could age better uh so if you could sort of achieve healthy aging uh, a one-year increase in life expectancy through aging better not just living longer was worth 38 trillion dollars in present value terms in the united states so those are enormous numbers and they kind of make sense. I mean, just think about COVID. We, we took action which really saw the economy nosedive in order to save years of life and to keep us healthy. So we know that health is incredibly valuable. I think for me, what was interesting during the course, I was very keen to focus on longevity and aging, the science as well as the social science, to focus on dementia and caring as well as the biotech industry. So every week was about a different sector. But every week you suddenly saw a big number. And of course, you added all those big numbers together and you get those nine trillions and those 38 trillions. So, you know, we started looking at the biotech sector and we're seeing around two billion dollars a year now going into uh, longevity orientated research. Then you look at the finance and insurance sector that's beginning to wake up to pensions and uh, longevity insurance. They've got fifty trillion dollars of assets under uh, under their guidance. You then look at the care market, which in the United States is estimated to be about half a trillion dollars a year. Then you look at the you know the F- you know, fast moving consumer good market, and you think about the money spent on food. So you know there's these huge numbers at the top that are sort of salivating uh, business people, but then you just break it down to every sector and you see where that big number comes from. Yeah, as you say, it's a market that obviously goes beyond pharma and biotech, which is what most people maybe initially associate with with longevity. But, you know, we often talk, you know, we've had discussions around the Longevity Forum about longevity really being a horizontal. It's a bit like a, like technology. It really touches every sector. It's, it's, it's not a vertical trend, but it's a horizontal trend. So 
Awareness of the business opportunity perhaps is one one area that we could help address. But what would you say are some of the misconceptions around the business of longevity specifically? So I, I think that this point about whether it's a vertical or a horizontal is really key. Uh, and you know that came across, I think, very much in the class with the different speakers from different sectors. I and mean, it was stunning how many people from huge multinationals to small startups we're trying to tap into this market and we're identifying it. But, you know, if we're talking about all of life and how do we age better in terms of achieving better health, better engagement, working longer, better finances, it cuts across everything. So I think when one of the challenges for every firm is, is this a background to what I'm currently doing or is it a self-contained topic itself? And obviously most firms, when they do innovation, they sort of start from what they currently do. So it's a little bit more of a background, I think, at the moment, rather than um, its own vertical. With the exception of biotech, where it clearly it is a very self-contained area, we are looking at developing potential therapeutics to try and improve how we age. So that's a very neat example. But elsewhere in the insurance sector, uh, in the sort of consumer goods sector, it's a bit more complicated. And I think that's one of the challenges you know i i call it the schrodinger's market after the schrodinger cat example where you know the physicist schrodinger has this logical example where there's a cat in a box and it's indeterminate whether the cat is alive or not and i think the aging longevity market is a bit like that firms they tend to get attracted to this market by those huge numbers we were just talking about you know everyone over 50 it's a nine trillion dollar market and everyone firms as well i want some of that but actually it's not a single market People are incredibly diverse in terms of how they age. And of course, not everyone over 50 or 65 is the same. Some people are high income, high wealth and high health, high education. Other people aren't. So it's a really, really mixed market. And the other challenge, I think, is that the the people in that market, they don't self-identify as an older market. So I think you've got this challenge. Every firm is becoming aware of the size of this market, but actually locating it and meeting it is what they're trying to do. And the challenge, I think, is to try and get the size of that market with scale. And at the moment, I think that's the challenge that corporates face. They're aware it's a big market, but how do I identify it? How do I target it? And how do I get that scale? And what do you think is required to, to bridge this gap between kind of the, the size of the market and the potential scale that uh, that it can achieve in the future? I mean, what what can... What can businesses do or perhaps what can platforms like the Longevity Forum also do to, to engage businesses around this topic? Yeah, well, that's obviously the, the, literally the multi-trillion dollar question, isn't it? And there's certainly going to be a lot of experimentation and there's, there will be some failures and there will be some successes. One of the themes that came across from most of the different weeks where we we're really were focused on very different businesses and different markets is that things are bubbling under. Um, and it you know, depends a little bit upon which sector you're looking at, how advanced things are. Clearly, when it comes to asset management, a big part of asset management for individuals is managing funds for retirement and bringing in insurance and health into that and seeing a convergence seems a natural way to go. And you can see that starting to happen. Um, and so I think there you're most likely to see size and scale begin to emerge. And that's a world where, of course, if people have got assets, they tend to be a bit more homogenous. Uh, their needs are a little bit more defined. Uh, you can identify it more. And it's already a market that you're just going to start to provide the services that they need. And I think you know that's the, the challenge. A lot of firms think, first of all, of an older market and not our, what are the needs of the people in this market. And even those who do think about what are the needs of the people in this market, they often don't actually then talk to the older consumer to find out what they are. They just think this is what they need. So there's a whole bunch of uh, age stereotypes, a whole bunch of misunderstandings, of, identi of thinking things that are age-specific rather than function and need-specific. So I think that's the, the first thing firms have got to do. What is the need that I'm trying to meet here? Then the next thing is the scale. And I think the scale is an interesting one because, you know, whenever you talk about businesses uh, and scale, everyone always talks about developing an app. But I'm not sure an app is the best way to tap into this market. Uh, so it's then a, how do you create a platform 
that will uh, give you that that scale if it's not going to be just tech. Uh, and there were some interesting ones. So we talked with uh, um, uh, one US company uh, who, who do uh, uh, care at home. And, you know, they recognized if you've got good carers in the home looking after people, that's then your platform because they're going to be aware of the needs of individuals in the home and they're going to be able to recommend products and services for that person. I thought that was a very interesting example of how to create a platform outside of a, a digital one. Uh, so there are some of the things that I would point to. There are also some, I know insurance is an area that you're also very interested in, Andrew, and uh, I know you looked at examples of innovation, perhaps. It's not, you know, innovation is not just kind of creating an app, as you say, as you say. it's also about looking at ways of turning longevity, uh, longer lifespans into, into a business opportunity. And I know, for example, the insurance industry is, is an area that you've, uh, you've talked about in the past. Well, insurance one is fascinating because, of course, in the 20th century, we saw this huge growth in the life insurance sector because there was a very high risk of midlife mortality. And so people wanted to insure their family that were they to die in midlife, they would be financially catered for. But as we see life expectancy increase, we're also seeing not just average life expectancy increase, but the risk of or the chance of living to very old ages is getting higher and higher. So there's kind of a new risk around, which is not dying very early, but dying very old. And how can you make sure that you're going to have finances to cope with living to 100? How are you going to cope with fight, keeping your health in a good state? So we kind of need longevity insurance. And I think that's a really, really interesting area for the insurance sector. And what's interesting there, I think, if you think particularly about the life insurance sector, they make more money the longer you live for because you pay premiums for longer and they pay out later. So it, it's in their interest to keep you healthy for longer. And I think that was a really concrete example of a multi-billion dollar industry that's already beginning to try and think about some of these opportunities. The insurance companies who are recognizing this integration of health and wealth and potentially helping provide you with the financial resources to fund a healthier, longer life because it's good for their profits. I think that's a really interesting area for innovation. And we've talked obviously about what businesses can do in terms of bringing more innovation and seeing the potential of longevity. But what about individuals um, and, and what can they do to be to become active participant in this, in this change and in this longevity economy? Yeah, and of course, that is the, the key. And one of the things I was really pleased about, so one of the fun things for me about teaching this course, and one reason I wanted to do it was, you know, when I talk about longevity or aging uh, in a public space or in conferences, I, you know, the audience is mainly over 50. Um, so they're interested in a certain bunch of questions and they also get it from a certain perspective. But the students I've got were ranging from sort of 21 to 50. So it was a very different age group. And one of the things I'm very keen to stress with longevity is that it's not about end of life. There are very, very real problems around dementia and care homes that are a, you know, a major social need and a major business opportunity. But for me, the most important thing about longevity is not that there's going to be more old people, but the probability of the young becoming the old has never been so high in human history. You know, for most of human history, if you were 20, you didn't have a high chance of getting to 70, 80, let alone 90. Some people did, but it was a minority. So you don't spend your life when you're 20 or 30 worrying about the outside chance of making it to 80 or 90. But of course, now in this high income countries, it's not an outside chance of making it to 90. The UK government, for instance, says that the majority of children born today will live to reach their 90s. So we, we need to prepare for the long term. And you know that number I gave you earlier from the AARP of $9 trillion of the silver economy, the money that's in older people. But I'd like to talk about the evergreen economy, which is that if we're living longer, we need to age well. And that's about being healthier for longer. It's about staying younger for longer. Yes, there's a lot of money to be spent on uh, dementia care, but people will spend even more if they can find ways to avoid getting dementia. So I like to think about the evergreen economy rather than the silver economy. Uh, for me, that's the big change that has to happen. We have to recognize the young will become old and we've got to make sure we age well across the lifespan. 
that of course isn't just a new human imperative because that's never been the case before but also it's really hard because we are not hardwired evolutionary to think long term but what really did delight me with the students was they kind of picked up on that evergreen very very well and it started to relate issues to them in a way that didn't just uh you know parochialize things around oh this is just about older people this is just about frailty uh they suddenly recognized this as something much more and it's obviously something we're, we're taking into account as we plan our events for Longevity Week um, in November uh, with our theme, Generations, because I know in particular you, Andrea, have been very passionate about um, you know early, early awareness and making this about the whole of life rather than the end of life. Um, in terms of your course, do you plan to repeat the course? Can we direct people to some resources, obviously beyond the 100-year life and, uh, and the related material? Uh, yeah, there's obviously my website. Uh, I am going to repeat the course. Of course, it's only for uh, London Business School students right now, although it'd be great if we can get wider uh, popularity and we can do it outside of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my personal website, uh, uh, which uh, will we'll, we'll flash up at the end of the, this uh, interview, uh, with the address for that, uh, where you can catch up with all my public speaking, the uh, research I do, as well as the, the wider uh, sort of blogging and podcasts that I do. And as you say, I'm looking forward to Longevity Week this year, where, you know, as always, we try and get a range of different speakers uh, in this topic, focusing on all aspects of longevity, but particularly raising that awareness that, you know, Longevity is about the young becoming old, not just what we do when we're old. If we are going to be healthier when we're old, it has to start earlier. We can't intervene easily with age-related illnesses. We have to try and keep people healthy. But it's not just health, it's skills, it's relationships, it's engagement. And you know, the challenge we've got at the moment is that these long lives we are not prepared for. We've got a, a, a uh, we've got patterns of behavior that were pinned down with a life expectancy of around 70, you know, the three stage life of education, work, retirement. And as life expectancy is stretching out, that social practices and government policies, they're not working. And it's obvious it's not working for those who are old, if you look at some of the problems around care homes and dementia care. But it's not just them as well. We've got, um, you know, people in their 50s who get discriminated against when they apply for jobs. But we've also got acute problems amongst younger generations where, you know, there's problems about access to housing. There's concern about how they're going to finance their pensions. So the map of life that we currently have got isn't working well for any generation. And we need to start to think about this from the young to the old and not just focus on an aging society and how we meet the growing needs of an ever-growing proportion of older people. We've got to think about what happens right the way through and think about this from an intergenerational perspective. Absolutely. And we're all looking forward to the Longevity Week events, which this year is running from the 14th to the 18th of November. In the meantime, Andrew, thank you so much for this fascinating discussion. Uh, and uh, we'll direct people to the andrewjscott.com website for, for the additional resources and for background reading to your course for those who are not fortunate enough to, to have attended it in person or are unable to obviously attend in the future. But thanks again, Andrew, and uh, look forward to seeing you in November. Thanks, Tafina. I'm looking forward to November very much. We are very grateful to our sponsor, Juvenescence, which has made this podcast possible as part of Longevity Week 2022. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.